arrive at 2100 Reading Rancheria Road on the left. So we're here at uh, Wind River Casinos. I had to remember the name. <laughs> uh, the reason not, we're not Wine River, right? <laughs> the reason we're here is, first of all, we didn't plan early enough to do a Memorial Day trip, which you know is always a big mistake. Um, all the RV parks are full at that point. Uh, but we found availability here, and the nice thing about it is that it's $26 a night to park, and we got full plug-in with 50 amp, and uh, and it's actually you know concrete patio type uh, living, but they do have quite a bit of um, green area, green area for barbecue yeah, exercise, barbecue exercise. They have a smoker, nice smoker there too. And of course, if you like. Casinos, uh, gambling, they have that too. The re main reason I wanted to show you uh, this angle shot is that one of the things that you always need to consider when you're in your RV is how are you going to get around once you plug in and park. You normally have your slides open and uh, your lift levelers are down and that won't allow you to um, move around easily so since we've done this in the past we've we've noticed that we felt really stranded once we got there unless we had a bicycle or another motor transportation as you can see in all these vehicles that are here they each have a different solution uh, got your toy haulers that is a pretty novel way to do things. You're, you're driving your vehicle, your toys up in the back of the trailer. You have uh, the bikes on the trailer and cars the on the trailer. And on this end you see also you have the motorcycle lifts and then the pull behind cars, uh, the tow cars. And of course, if you have a fifth wheel or a trailer, then you can unhook and you have the ability uh, at that point to um, take off in your vehicle. Be more mobile, right? Mobile is key. There's pros and cons to each of these. If you have a trailer, you can't easily access areas. You can't turn around as easily, but you can unhook and you've got a, a vehicle to use this or you have your vehicles yeah, on the trailer. Yeah, this trailer is like us. They are hauling a motorcycle, BMW motorcycle. It's a car hauler and a motorcycle combination, which is a pretty good way to go. Yeah. If More you have convenient. to lift your front wheels, then uh, uh, it's, that's a good option. There's a toy hauler here. And the fifth wheeler, which is always a popular way to go. And then what we've chosen to do, we've We've done a 25 foot uh, trailer in the past and we found that although you can haul a lot of stuff, uh, you can't find any place to park it. You're 65 feet and a couple states you're not even legal. Yeah, we are too long. It's fine for hauling straight, but the minute you've got to get to some places, it's kind of like a barbed hook. If you, uh, if you get down a road that's too narrow and you can't turn around, you have to back up. At one point we noticed on Google Maps that uh, the road had changed to access the highway and I had to do a turnaround. I actually had to do a U-turn in the, or a T-turn in the major intersection because uh, you were to a county road otherwise and it wasn't the access that was shown on the map. So that's a big problem. But a trailer is always useful as you, uh, you've probably experienced. You have to be skilled, though, at driving a trailer. The benefit of having a, a lift on the back is that uh, you don't even hardly know it's there. It, it may steer a little butt heavy, uh, so it's a trade-off. It takes a little bit of time to hook it up and mount it, uh, 
But once you're on the road, uh, it's pretty easy to, to move around because you can back up just like it's not there. You just have to know that the length is there. We are heading back to San Jose today. So now we are going to load motorcycle onto the lift. See how the motorcycle get on the motorcycle lift. Okay, so now bag is on the lift, so we need to strap it down to ensure you will not move around when we are moving. Okay, so it will oh, tie down, so we, we are going to... four straps. They may not be totally tight, but they're pretty good so far. I'm going to lift it up now so I can work on it a little better. Uh oh. Now is a Monday, 29th, May 29th, 2017. It's really narrow turn. Oh, almost hit it. So we are heading back to San Jose. auxiliary fuse for the basement for this basically power to the outside and it was a 20 amp circuit now uh, I think if I recall that which only requires 15 amps peak uh, current so anyhow it was halfway up on the on the loading process when the winch stopped hard you know like like it lost power and once I Got my voltmeter out, checked the DC voltage. Clearly across that breaker, there was no power. And it's a special larger termination breaker. It's not like the standard spade lugs you plug in. It was, uh, it's got two 1033, uh, 1036 screws on each end that you screw on eyelets for the cable since it's like a 10 gauge cable that I wired up. Uh, anyhow, luckily I had other uh, circuits that I could plug to. I tapped off of a 30 amp on the refrigerator uh, and, and that took care of the problem. So now I've got to replace the fuse. But I don't know why it happened. I, I lifted it up and down several times. The only difference really is that it's probably 15 degrees hotter here. Yeah, it's really hot Maybe here. 20 degrees hotter than when I last did it. It's really hot, you know, so it's going to get up to mid-90s. On the pavement, it was probably close to 100. So maybe the engine got hotter. But the odd thing is normally when you start a winch, it's a, it's a short circuit until the inductive uh, power is up and the inductive level gets higher so the initial surge current is really high and that's normally when you pop it but that's not when it occurred we had moved uh, up halfway through the cycle and that took probably 15 seconds maybe yeah, and, and then all of a sudden through. it popped i don't know uh, i'm not sure why else, you know, unless maybe I kind of let up on the switch a little bit and then push back down. But anyhow, I wouldn't have thought it would have happened. So, what do you think about the babies now? So, it's strange. This is the first time this has ever happened, but we thought we fixed it. The uh, fluid was low on the uh, hydraulics. Uh, I think because I have a ram leveler that is leaking a little oil and uh, the, the
vat on the hydraulic fluid may have gotten low enough. Not sure if that created air in the line or what, but it, it could also just be electrical because I, I put uh, fluid back in the reservoir, so I should have taken care of it. He was. But I noticed when I turn on my headlights, for some reason the the PSI gauge kind of goes down erratically. So thought maybe I have bad power to the gauges, um, but clearly uh, I've got to resolve this problem. So when we get to a place where I can pull over, uh, I will do so and try and figure out what it is. We better figure out that problem soon because it's kind of safety issue, okay? It's Johnny. It's Johnny. So the, the gauge. The first of all, with the first problem we encountered was the uh, PSI. Jacks. Well, the jacks first. The, the jacks per first, and then now the this trip is the PSI gauge. Yeah. Right. We on the BB sound. Oh, yeah, no BB sound today. Don't tell oh, knock on the wood. Oh, <laughs> knock on wood. And then the third problem, third issue we encountered this trip is what's the, the winch issue. For the, the loader on the uh, cycle. And my very capable husband fixed them all. <laughs> I'm so surprised. I pity folks that don't know electrical systems or mechanical systems because on an RV there's a lot of complex uh, systems that are not normal to the regular every, car. everyday household or automotive use. So I, it's and been it's a real been, education it, for it's me. It's different than a regular car too, right? Yeah, it's it's been a real, I think, a challenge for me, you know. You, Luckily, I've backed up a lot of trailers and driven a lot of trucks, so I'm fairly familiar with that. But uh, people that are have been in cars all of their life and they finally get an RV, uh, you know, they unless they buy brand new and even then they can have problems. They've got a learning curve. There's a lot of systems to learn. I've had numerous electrical things on the inverter that I had to figure out. When we have bad power, sometimes it would suck. The uh -huh. AC would cycle on yeah. off initially, uh -huh. and then the ground must have got uh, connected again because it, it's kind of gone away. We haven't had that problem for a while. Where we normally our home base camp, we only live off a 30 amp circuit, which is uh, you know you have to be uh, careful what you turn on. You can't turn on two AC units at the same time. So. Uh, so overall, RV life is not easy. <laughs> you have to learn everything on your own. So it's better if you, you knew a little bit about the electric thing, which I don't, so I cannot help anyway. <laughs> so that's RV life for now. So the issue with the air pressure, air brakes, are going down, it's a big problem because number one, there's two things that are really critical to safety in an RV as in any moving vehicle, tires and brakes. You want to be able to steer and you want to be able to stop. When you have two gauges on here that you're supposed to keep at a minimum, I believe it is 75 psi. When you have gauges flickering on and off, and you think, oh no, I've lost power. Uh, in the case of what we have right now, we think it's a false reading. We have power. It's known that freight liners in their control modules, uh, they get bad connections or bad grounding, solder, uh, cold solder joints. Uh, as one of the problems, and the gauges tend to cycle on and off, which means that the warning lights turn on and off. It occurred to us uh, it, when we started coming up to our trip up to uh, Shasta. 
Shasta Lake. Uh, I noted that when I turned the headlights on, the alarm would go off and the meter would go down, which indicated to me that there was something electrical, 12 volt related, uh, that was a problem. So I probably either got a short of the panel or the module. Uh, anyhow, it, it hasn't been a problem yet on the way home. But the issue is now I believe it's a false reading on the gauges. And the big problem is that when you don't trust your gauges and you think, well, it went down, but I know it's okay, uh, you know, that's dangerous too because you could have a secondary problem where your, uh, your air actually does go down and if you get down to 40 psi, your emergency brakes are going to kick on as a safety precaution, but clearly, you know, that's, that's a big problem too. So, uh, it is Memorial Day. There's no easy way to find a mechanic to fix it. I'm not even sure exactly where the control module is yet. The reservoir is in the front of the chassis, and there are a couple of connections or things on there, but someone says that the control module is backed by the, uh, where the compression occurs on the engine. Uh, so I'll have to do a little more look and see, uh, you know, on the engine area, or maybe someone online, uh, one, of our, one of our viewers uh, has a good idea as to, you know, what things to look at. I've read online that one guy had a service done on it, they replaced the control module, it cost them a thousand dollars for that replacement, and, uh, you know, so that's, that is an expensive lesson. Especially since it's probably a Freightliner problem in the design that they've had for a long time. You think there should be some kind of warranty recall on that. Anyhow, that's my rant now for uh, <laughs> troubleshooting air pressure on air brakes. Didn't you try to uh, put oh. off low oh, yeah. in also, the beginning? Also, uh, there's a test where you do where you take the safety brake off when you're parked and it's a neutral and hopefully you're not rolling, you're blocked up and uh, you push on the safety brake uh, with the engine off, AC on, accessory on, so 12 volts on because your gauges work. So pump them a few times and then hold it to see if you're losing any pressure. The, uh, the safety rating, I think it is, you can't lose more than, I don't know, I forget how many, three pounds per minute, if I remember correctly. Uh, so basically you don't want them to go down very much, you don't want to have a leak. When I, when I put pressure on the brakes, there was no leakage occurring at all, which is a really good sign that your brakes, you know, the, the system's closed loop cell still and, uh, you know, you don't have any leak anywhere in the system. So again, that supports the theory that this is an electrical issue for a sensor or control module. More voltage problems, 101. Someone also mentioned uh, that when you have a lift, as we have for the motorcycle in the back, if your license plate is blocked, that the uh, I have a chance that uh, law enforcement will uh, let you have a ticket for not having it easily viewable. I'm wondering if maybe I could just print a copy of the photo of the license plate and mount it in front of the bike so that you can still read what the plate number is. Uh, and then if you lose it, you know, you have to concern with it. Otherwise, you're having to move the, the plate back and forth, which is a real pain in the butt. So, I don't know if that would make sense or not. To, up, put on a poster board. A so if anyone has a good advice or suggestion about how do we put the license plate of the motorcycle link, please uh, leave the, your comments. Okay, thank you. We are now 
about getting off highway to get some fuel because we saw a gas station called Loves. If you can see the sign up there, you can see the sign, the yellow sign there. It's called Love. It feels so like home because we see them a lot in uh, Indiana. So we don't see them often here. Oh, there's another Phaeton pulling into the Love gas station. It's just like oh, ours. So why we like a love, the gas station love, because it's really wide, you see the wide entry. So if you are riding a, driving an RV, it's very easy to pull in. And uh, it's because it's for truck, so the gas station is really wide and tall. And high, I mean the ceiling is high, so I have no problem to pull in the gas station. So that's why we like love. So the reason, another reason why we like gloves is because the gas station in the uh, street on the street is so tight, and some most of the entries are really difficult to pull in. They are very narrow, so sometimes we hit the our tires will hit the bump. So that's why we like gloves. So now we are we are going into. Scale. We wanted to. We want to know how heavy our home is. We so know how much weight I got on each axle. Uh, with the bike with on. The bike, yeah, with the bike. So here you can see so the truck, the gas station for truck. So it's easy, really easy access here. So the skill is the skill on the left side over there or here. Okay, you can go here. You don't need to talk to the people. So how can we tell how much weight are we? The left side they will show. Will they show something on the left side? Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, you'll come back in the store. What is your last name? My son. When they ask you for your truck number, just tell them that we put it under Blanchard. Thank you. Alright, you're all set. Go ahead and come on in. Okay. It's done? Yeah, I've got to go in and get the receipt now. Oh, okay. Now, in a minute, we'll find out how we, how heavy we are with the bike. So our gross vehicle weight is supposed to be no more than 32,000. Thing. Yeah, thirty-two thousand. No, thirty-six thousand. I have to look at the thing again. I think it's the thirty-six thousand you maybe mentioned one time, so maybe four. Maybe. Now we have another sound beeping. Well, be. <laughs> another another beep sound. One after another, always. So we need to troubleshoot that one okay. and figure out what's that sound for. The, this gas station is really huge, wide open, so it's really easy to move, to drive around, turn around, no parking here. Okay, all set. Total weight's 32,000. front is 12 and the rear is 20. Okay, so we're close. So we're basically over by a little bit on both axles. We are over 300 pounds, right? Yeah, 300 pounds and we're 1,300 pounds over on the rear, which is about what the lift weight is. So when we do this next trip, we should try and uh, Get rid of a little more weight. Okay. So how much for the weight? First we just put gas fuel in the tank too and that's 
That's probably five, six hundred pounds. But we have an empty tank, water tank, right? Yeah, Almost basically empty. an empty tank, yeah. yeah. The water tank and the gray water tank and the black water tank too, right? Yeah. So yeah. we're right at our limit now, basically. Mm. So how much do we pay for the scale? Eleven dollars for the scale. That's a good deal. Hmm? Is it? Isn't it? I don't know. I thought it was free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's so free. I free. It Nothing is free in California, okay? Stay tuned to our next episode when we ride our motorcycle to Mount Shasta and Lake Shasta.